Hey everyone, welcome to Locked On Lakers for Friday. Andy Kamenetsky here. And coming up, Brian and I are going to be talking with Locked On Nets co-host Adam Arbrecht in a crossover episode where we compare and contrast the state of the Lakers and the Nets, two of the most scrutinized, high-profile, and chaotic franchises over the last several seasons in the NBA, what they have in common, what makes them very different. Uh, general note, this show was recorded before the Nets announced their suspension of at least five games for Kyrie Irving, but the conversation still holds either way, and we think you guys are going to dig it. You are Locked On Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, so depending on who introduced you to which show, you are now here, though, with all three of us locked on Nets, locked on Lakers, Sans, Doug Nori, obviously, Andy and Brian Kamenetsky. I, 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 always, I always butcher your guys' last name. No, you're name, good. That was oh, it. That was perfect. Woo. All right, never mind. I take nothing. I, I, I make no uh, concessions here, which maybe is apropos for a little bit of discussion we're going to have here. <laughs> we're going to obviously get into just the Lakers and the Nets and their season. That was the intention here, but... Uh, as Andy and I were discussing before we started, this was a, a plan that I put in place a week ago. Boy, life comes at you fast, eh, friends? Because but since then, Kyrie Irving has obviously been under an enormous level of scrutiny, rightfully so, for first posting uh, a link to a movie based off of a book that is essentially not only disinformation, but also heavily anti-Semitic. Uh, he responded to that with only Kyrie-like responses which were I, I don't know why people are concerned about what i post i both wield and do not wield any power i cannot be anti-semitic as most recently as today we're recording this on thursday said i cannot be anti-semitic based on where i come from and what my beliefs are those are hard responses to take plus on, I think, adam me. yeah he didn't make the documentary also true which he noted yeah um yes. and I, <laughs> I mean to be fair that is comforting it, it, it's, 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 it would, it be, would worse. be worse if he made the documentary I and mean, it would be worse. So to be 100% clear, as I completely bogart the top of the show, uh, we're going to talk about purely basketball stuff for the majority of this episode so that Nets and Lakers fans alike can enjoy it. But just from an outside perspective, because we have all crossed over together before, we've, we've communicated before, I respect both of you guys in the way that you cover the sport and then just uh, some of the narratives that go beyond it. Did you have a instant perspective on this as it all started to unfold? Do you find it incredibly troubling that the NBA seemed to take a great deal of time reacting to it, knowing that there is a scheduled conversation between Adam Silver and Kyrie coming up later this week? I mean, as far as the way Kyrie's handling it, it's exactly how I thought he would handle it. I, I tweeted out uh, Wednesday at Cam Brothers um, after Kyrie and the Nets put out that statement in, in which a lot of people noted that Kyrie did not apologize. And in, a, in an instance like this, where you know people are looking for an apology, even if you're not genuinely sorry, the PR thing is to do an apology, even if it's mealy mouth. So not apologizing is a very specific choice. And I tweeted out, do I think Kyrie's sorry? No, but proof one way or another won't come through a statement co-written by his bosses, but rather the first time he takes questions and the next time he tries to show us he's more enlightened than the rest of us mm -hmm. because there will be a next time. And as it turns out, he killed two birds with one stone because the next time he took questions and the next time he tried to show he was more enlightened than the rest of us came in the same session, you know, 12 hours after the statement or whatever. So it's not surprising. And to be honest, I, if Kyrie's not sorry, don't apologize. Like, I, I don't want yeah. a an apology with a gun to his head because that doesn't mean anything. But to your point, though, Adam, what really matters is how the league goes about handling this because, to put it kindly, they've dropped the ball. And, you know, Brian, the, the, we also heard that it took this – it was lag time from the Brooklyn Nets as well because they waited, got in touch with the ADL, and most people speculated it was – what does the blowback look like? If we do nothing, how will you respond to this? And even though raising funds to help in the Anti-Defamation League and their efforts is a positive thing, it does have a little bit of a, so how much money do we need to throw at this so that it doesn't really come back against us? And as we know, 
Brooklyn has a large Jewish community. So there are these these colliding elements here. Um, do you feel like right now, because we can even take it just beyond Kyrie, there's also the Josh Primo situation that's Oof. unfolding with San Antonio Spurs, which looks about as terrible uh, and, and unfolding more terribly than it even felt like initially. Um, does it feel like the NBA is kind of having one of those starts to, to a league season where they've got a lot of stuff to sort out coming off of a couple of years where it felt like they were on the front foot of so many social issues and so many concerns that that people, individuals, and players were bringing up. Well, I, I think that's that gets to like the challenge that the NBA faces because what they have here is a it's not Donald Sterling, you know, with you know the Magic Johnson stuff and 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 V. No, they just went through that with Robert Sarver, <laughs> right? It's you know, but what they have is. It, are are sort of complex problems where you know Adam Silver on Thursday made it very clear, you know he wishes the Nets you know sort of uh, he he was unsatisfied with uh, with Kyrie's uh, apology and statement and by, by sort of by proxy by the reaction of the Nets. But I, I this is one of those times where I am reminded that this the 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 league works for the owners. It's not the other way around and. You know, what does Adam Silver do when Kyrie tweets, amplifies something that he shouldn't be amplifying, that is abhorrent in so many ways, but uh, in so many ways, but, you know, is, is, is complex in terms of what Kyrie is doing. Like, I don't think Kyrie Irving is anti-Semitic in like a school ties kind of way to go back to that movie. Like, you know, like what he's doing here is different, you know, than, that sort of classic, you know, anti-Jew rhetoric. It is, it's different. He's trying to achieve some sort of enlightenment. He's looking at his heritage. He's doing a lot of stuff and is running into his own sort of intellectual ego in the process. Um, and I think the league is just sitting there going, what exactly do we do about this when a player, what, what Pandora's box are we opening up? What, precedents are we opening up and you know what what happens when the nets hire Ime Odoka? like what do we do about that like the celtics obviously made a choice here um and then the nets turn around and hire the guy weeks after the celtics basically you know ran him off and they probably only didn't fire him for legal reasons to make sure that they had every i dotted and every t crossed and then the nets turn around and hire him so i think it, it might have done it, this in the hopes that maybe somebody would hire him. Maybe, maybe, but I leaving think that option open. Yeah, maybe, but I'm sure they're happy. Look, they didn't argue about. They didn't, they didn't ask for compensation. That they, they were happy to let. I mean, you could argue take. that the Celtics actually, uh, their behavior in this, or sort of their own morality, was compromised because if they really wanted Adoka to feel the punishment that they doled out, they would say, "No, you can't just give him another job. We are not. We are not acquiescing to this." Right, I one guess. year from now, you can re-enter the market yeah, potentially. But, but, but then, that open, my my only point is like that. But that opens up potential. Like there is a limit as to what the league can really do in these situations to control teams, to control players, to do all of these things. And I think we we came through that stretch, Adam. That you talked about the sort of idealized uh, uh, version of what we want. You know, what many people, not everybody, but what many people would love the league for to be. From a from a social justice standpoint, from an equity standpoint, and what we're finding is it's still a a, a corporate entity with thirty separate um, bosses to the guy in the center who is the you know we like to think runs it, but actually works for those owners. Yeah, and we see this across most sports as well, right? Roger Goodell is the lightning rod for fans to dump all of their hate and anger and rage about whatever issue it may be. Meanwhile, he is just the guy that is trying to navigate the expectations of the owners of the league, not to say that they don't have their own set of control there. To tie this into the Lakers, though, um, coming into this year, the Lakers turned over their head coach. Um, they have a disgruntled player on their team in Russell Westbrook, or at least have a, a issue with a player that is on their team. At times they seem like they have a disgruntled player in LeBron. A hundred percent. And by the way, at the highest possible level, which I think is what matters most here, right? Because you can go to the third or fifth most important player on a team and say, okay, you may not be mostly satisfied, but you don't matter as much. So your concerns don't matter as much, which is also true. Um, but 
to compare these things because the one thing with with Kyrie Irving, which you know, ultimately we often say, I think that Kyrie Irving perceives himself to be something that he maybe is not truly, and that is th- this level of enlightenment or a level of educated or level of of voice around certain things. It doesn't mean that sometimes, not this instance. He can communicate things genuinely about a given topic or social issue. Then there are a myriad of times when he seems to misstep. And in this and in this particular instance, seems to make an egregious mistake that he's unwilling to acknowledge fully or fully take responsibility for. Unlike even a disgruntled LeBron James, who I think by and large, at least from afar, I've always perceived to be a, a thoughtful individual when it comes to topics that arise around the league and genuinely seems to be on the the right side is the wrong way to phrase it, but seems to be on the progressive side of a discussion. Is that does that seem like a fair assessment from the outside for the Lakers and and why, even in a tumultuous last year and a half for them in a lot of ways, their face of their franchise is a fairly reliable member of that organization. And if I'm and if I'm judging by facial expressions, I could be off base here a little bit. It seems like they're. I'm just thinking. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to. I'm trying to never think thought about, about it quite the way you're yeah. putting it. Mm. Good. Um, it's hard hitting. <laughs> I think here's what I would say: that a big difference between LeBron and Kyrie is does LeBron always hold himself accountable in every single instance where accountability could be warranted? No. Right. I mean, he you know, for example, he clearly has. I mean, not that you necessarily expect a player to do this because it just opens such a Pandora's box and of weirdness. But you know, let's let's just say he hasn't said my bad for the whole Russ thing. You know, no, he's I mean, sort of he memory hold his uh, his his right. role in the fact and, that Russ is here to begin with. Or, or you could get to a few years ago with the situation with Daryl Morey and the tweet with Hong Kong and mm. LeBron taking questions about the relationship between the league in China and Nike in China, where you know, which has LeBron uh, linked in the middle of all of this and. You know, his answers in the moment were surprisingly clumsy for somebody who's typically quite good at this stuff. And that's true. Maybe one of the first instances where he seemed. And, and, you know, I mean, I remember confused about which way to go with it. Yeah. Well, there was one point where he said that he didn't know enough about this, which I, I don't buy. But I actually asked him directly, do you plan on trying to learn more? And he dodged the question. And, you know, and to be fair to LeBron, I think he became the face of this in ways that are not entirely fair anyway. Mm -hmm. But a big difference, though, I would say between LeBron and Kyrie is LeBron is not somebody who goes out of his way to double and triple down as a matter of principle. I would say that's maybe the biggest difference in terms of where either one of them will end up if there are uncomfortable moments well, i would say to me i think you know, I, I i agree with you andy i mean i i mean there are other obvious differences in the sense that you know lebron is not um you know a rabbit hole conspiracy theorist which you know is at the, is at the root of what is is animating a lot of what and, and all these sort of quasi intellectual baggage that goes along with that um I think LeBron is more willing to take accountability, not all the time, and nobody's perfect. I mean, I think we all, we like to hold people to a, oh, you're strong here, but what about that? Like, as if you're supposed to be perfect on every issue, and that's not fair to anybody. But LeBron is much more willing to take accountability than Kyrie, who clearly wants all the ability to provoke and all the ability to um, be smarter and wiser than everyone but none of the accountability that comes with anything that he says and so but i think the biggest difference is or at least one of the biggest differences is there's no sense that the other things that lebron does whether it's business whether it's social uh, justice issues whether it's the work he's doing in akron to build schools or and all of those things are more important to him than basketball are more important to him than his obligations to the team to the league to the Lakers, where I think with Kyrie, there is every sense that this stuff that he finds more important and more enlightened and, and those aspects of him that he believes are whatever, more enlightened to, to use that again, might actually be more important than the basketball. And it might be more important to him. And and I don't think um, there's any might. I've said many right. times he does not want to play basketball full time. And so I you're dismissive. Obvious. 
you are even, dismissive even of him topics when you, that are areas that he wants to explore in his life. Which and it, I, it, I don't even say that with judgment. I'm no, no. If you no. don't want to play, if basketball doesn't hold the same interest to him that it did six or seven years ago, that's fine. It's a problem though if you're his employer, running a basketball team, right? <laughs> like and, and, and paying Lakers him a lot of no money. Reason, right. The Lakers have no reason to believe that LeBron isn't interested in the the best possible performance on the court or having the, you know, steering the team to the best possible result, passive aggressive stuff that he does aside. And I think that's a significant difference between the two of them. All right. So in a second here, let's turn our attention more fully into basketball. Obviously, if you're looking for a deeper coverage around the Kyrie Irving situation, Locked on Nets podcast, we will be having uh, plenty of content around this as it continues to unfold and what remains. Uh, wouldn't you know it? Another tumultuous season for the Brooklyn Nets. But I do have a question that I want to pose to the fine Locked On Lakers fellows. We have to tell you, though, about our friends over at Prize Picks because, my goodness, if you were wondering what is it all about when you want to not get into that day to day trying to go up against all the big sharks and you want to make you want to make a little bit of fun there, you want to throw a couple shekels down. Bottom line is here's how it works: Prize Picks pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than the Prize Picks line. You can win up to 10 times your money on a single entry. It's no competing against other players. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize Picks offers projections not just for the NBA, but also NFL, MLB, NHL, college football for crying out loud, men's college basketball, women's college basketball. Think about it. If it's a sport, you can go on Prize Picks and you can go ahead and get up against those projections rather than taking on a pool of who knows whateries that may be working some sleight of hand there to try to get the edge. You know that it's going to be safe and fast withdrawals as well, and entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. You go ahead and you download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com and sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match on up to $100 when you use the promo code locked on. If you deposit, 100 bucks they're gonna match you with 100 bucks you deposit 50 bucks they gave you 50 bucks you can do the math on that it's pretty straightforward don't forget though enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match of up to 100 with prize picks okay fellas real quick here um, I do want to talk about the way the seasons have started for both these teams, what the outlook is obviously very bright in Brooklyn. Um, but would you be any, any interest out there in reuniting Kyrie Irving with LeBron James? Do we think maybe? Oh, who all of a sudden loves the idea of Russell Westbrook right. on their yeah. team? Oh, you know, yeah, we're all hanging Nets out. Could, What's $47 use million a, dollars between oh, friends, guys? The, the Nets, Nets could, could use a sixth, sixth man. man of the year. Right. <laughs> That sounded oh. all too that sounded all too synchronized there to not think that maybe you guys haven't had some discussions. Oh, it, it, well, I mean, look, Kyrie is still up until you know a week ago was the most prominent name that people talked about um, with free agency and this this plan B that the Lakers have of if you don't make a trade for uh, uh, involving Westbrook this year. It's with the idea that you were going to go into the summer with cap space that you could use to sign someone that you could use to trade into. And Kyrie Irving is the name at the top of the list because there's certainly every indication that he might not have much of a future in in Brooklyn. We there's no, I, I think at this point, <laughs> no. Um yeah. for for all for all kinds of reasons. But like it, it's I don't even want to say the least of which is the 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 anti-Semitic, you know the promotion of the anti-Semitic film. It's just, there's just too much there. And I think the Lakers, the notion that you would commit, you know, hunt, you know, tens of millions of dollars and more importantly, years to Kyrie in this off season um, is mind boggling to me. Look, a lot can happen between now and then. And there's all kinds of image rehab that can be done and things the Lakers can say and do and things Kyrie can say and do to try to make everybody pretend that um, this wasn't a thing and that ultimately, um, because they believe they want the player in the same way that the Nets will come up with something to say about Ime Odoka and vetting and feeling comfortable and all of these things because they believe he's the coach out there that can help them win fastest and they don't care about the other stuff. And so maybe that will be the what the Lakers do. But no, I think is the short answer there. Because I was going to say, are, are the Lakers desperate enough with, with LeBron James being there, right? It feels like every year with LeBron James is a desperate year because we know that he's older and you want to maximize his value. And obviously he wants to always be winning. Are they desperate enough where knowing that you actually could trade for Kyrie Irving 
and not have to commit to him long term. You know, you could just take the storm for this year and improve your chances. I, I tend to think that it'd be a hard, a hard choice for an organization to make in this moment right now. But a month from now, right, a month and a half from now, you know, when the deadline comes up, you know what, and- you, you, Adam, what you're talking about, Andy, is what Andy and I kind of half jokingly referred to as, and I know there are people out huh. in sort of Lakers Nation as the anti-Semitism discount. Like you are, you're taking advantage of where Le, where Kyrie is to be able to trade Westbrook and give up less. Yep. Um, you know, like you, you you do the rental thing, knowing that he's a distressed asset, but he's a distressed asset for reasons that ought not be tolerable to the organization. But Andy, I mean, and just a month ago, this was a yeah. player and a team in the Nets who said, "We're never taking Russell Westbrook off your hands. You need to give us more draft capital here." And by the way, I, the, just to be clear, I understand the the ickiness of having a discussion around what's going on with Kyrie, and then saying, "So where's his trade value at?" Right? But but we also understand that this well, is what the NBA is. There are well, teams they've convers- already. I mean, it's, it's already been reported. Yeah. It's a conversation because it's part of what do the Nets do next? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because their choices are either trade him if you can wave him or pretend none of this is happening and keep him on the court like even after a suspension or whatever i, I mean it does seem like it does do. seem like they were yeah. willing to do a little bit of pretend it's not happening that seemed right. to be their first move was maybe we act like this isn't as big a deal as it is and i mean look unfortunately kyrie has you know kept it in the spotlight yeah he he has and his you know again his post media his post written statement media session could not have gone any worse. Um, I mean, Brian knows this because we talked about it all last off season. We've talked about it even during the season. I believe you and I have talked about this, Adam, in, in different crossovers. I would have traded in the off season Russ for Kyrie straight up because you're basically just trading problem for problem. Would I have attached a pick to Russ? Maybe. Would have never done two. And among the reasons I would have never done too is I think any team who ever decides to get into a long-term commitment with Kyrie Irving is out of their bleep in mind. I, I, I can't put it any more succinctly. It's an absolutely foolish thing to be doing. But to the other question about the Lakers' desperation, in certain respects, the answer is, well, Russ is still on the team. They've had opportunities to move him. You know, they could have moved him for Kyrie, like we talked about. They could have moved him for various members of the Utah Jazz poo-poo platter. They clearly could move him for... We have to stop calling him that because the Utah Jazz poo-poo platter is like the second best record in the Western Conference. That's a tasty so, poo-poo that is platter. True. That's, that one, it, well, taste, that's it, one tasty platter. If that's, if that's, mo- if that's poo-poo. We owe, you know we owe, the, we owe the, the poo-poo, poo-poo platter an apology. Well, I was going to say, actually, an apology. the poo-poo platter, which I believe may have been originated by Zach Lowe, just as a way of describing, like, if you've never had the poo-poo platter, <laughs> right. it's, it's a bunch of different stuff, like different dim sum, different. Right. It's basically the whole kitchen sink. The reality is, as a dish, the poo-poo platter is pretty good. It's quite it's, tasty. It, it's P-U-P-U, not P-O-O-P-O-O. <laughs> but, you know, they, they could have moved Russ by now. If they were that desperate to do something, they'd have already moved him. So I think the answer to your question is, Maybe they want to try to leverage the net situation, I guess, but I wouldn't necessarily call that desperation or mm. so or a hundred percent desperation because they would actually be in a, a position of advantage. I still don't a, think they'll do it though. Yeah, and there's an analog here in LA, I think, and it's not completely apples to apples, but acquiring distressed assets at what seemed like a bargain price. Um, because the asset is distressed for some really bad reasons. Uh, and that's the Dodgers with Trevor Bauer. And the it, it, beyond the, the fact that it literally didn't work like on the field, the reaction to that move, um, I think, was very much not worth it for the Dodgers. Uh, and I don't think the Lakers would go there. I don't think they should go there. Um, because I also don't think it's in, in the long-term interest of the franchise. So Lakers will trade for Kyrie Irving. Let's keep this conversation (laughs) going here in a second. So the other thing then that I was curious about was, again, seemingly in the offseason, both these franchises seemed in somewhat similar states. Now, the Nets stuck with their head coach for seven more games, but the Lakers made a switch at head coach, gets in the door, and the first thing he says is, don't you worry about Russ, Westbrook. I've got a plan. 
why did that like why did that crumble so quickly i mean it, it seemed like a good selling point if the idea was you had an understanding that that westbrook was going to buy into that now i've seen interviews from afar after the first couple of games and some real what we would expect clunker shooting performances from westbrook where he seems to be saying what's in the best interest of the team like that he's on board with it but that can also just be because he understands where the state of his value is around the league and the money that he's making did the Lakers have a clear plan coming into this year or was it kind of another let's see what happens and we'll we'll make our assessments on the fly I think Russ has responded well to Darvin and clearly has a level of respect for Darvin Ham that he did not have for Frank Vogel mm -hmm. Darvin Ham is somebody that exudes credibility and he exudes gravitas. And as I often like to say, once you've been shot in the face, you are no longer afraid of Russell Westbrook. Um, it's an old saying. But I – and I think maybe – I mean, it's always a dangerous game to try to gauge Russell Westbrook's self-awareness. But but he may recognize that if, he, if he's seen as somebody that refuses to adjust at all on the heels of – the disastrous first season he had with the Lakers, there's a good chance he could be out of the league. Um, right. Like a really good chance. So Russ may recognize this from a career preservation standpoint. You know, it's also felt too like the when is this going to happen has been weighing on the whole team, weighing on Darwin, but also weighing on Russ. Like just sort of waiting for it. Mm -hmm. And then it finally happened. And I think sort of everybody has been able to move forward. You know, it being playing off the bench. Right. I it's like you know there's a we talked about this on on, thir on Thursday's show like there's an element of bleep you that Russ can do to all the doubters and the haters and whatever and like Russ needs a chip on his shoulder like this he is motivated by that he is a guy who has been fueled by these sorts of things and everybody's oh it's not gonna come off the bench he's gonna blow the whole thing up the Lakers should just send him home uh, before and just get it over with and not even like give him a chance to try to play the role. Um, and I think part of what you're seeing here, and we saw it in you know, the way he answered questions after Wednesday's game and, and all this stuff is like, he's just as edgy, just as combative. He's not, you know, he didn't turn himself into like Dwight Howard who went from like heel to like cuddly lovable guy again, like in his second stint in LA and, you know, reborn and, and, you know, and, and all that. I, 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 th I think he's, I think he's doing whether it's out of spite, whether it's whatever he's, this is what he's going to be. Um, as long as he is playing well, as long as I think the narrative around him uh, is constructive, I think that the, the response from fans is good. And it has been I mean, Lakers fans want anything positive to cheer for. I think this is what you're going to get. I mean, like I'm just, I am fascinated by where these teams are because the Lakers can't score, but have like the third best defense in the league. The Nets, I get in the middle of the pack offensively, which is weird given who they have, and they're just a catastrophically bad defensively. Like well, how the way, these teams got here in terms of like deconstructing culture, deconstructing rosters, doing all this stuff. It's it's like the Nets have been trying to hold my beer, the Lakers, after every bad move that that, that LA has made. It's it's interesting you say that, um, Brian and and Adam. This this swings back to when you reached out to us last week about doing this crossover because the idea of basically just being two organizations in chaos. Let's let's have a chat. Um, and you know, not that two wins in a row has all all of a sudden fixed the Lakers, but they don't seem like they're in the exact same place right now. And I think it highlights though, a big difference that's always been there um, this season or really the last few seasons with the Lakers and the Nets as rudderless and badly run and at times very tense and, you know, a lot of tension that has existed within the Lakers. They have not been a, an organization of toxicity. No, There's not been a no. toxic environment, even even when things were bad with Westbrook, like as bad as they've gotten, it didn't feel like the entire organization had developed this just ambiance of toxicity. It just felt like there's a bad thing going right now between a high profile player and the organization. The Nets have been increasingly toxic. And Brian mentioned culture. 
it wasn't that long ago that the Nets were considered an incredible culture. Well, it was the culture that got Durant to want to come there. Well, and it's insane to think that, say, LeBron James and Anthony Davis, right, the two best players for the Lakers, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, that is the big difference, is that you have two guys that, for whatever's going wrong with L.A., they're still really good when they're on the court together and they're healthy and they're playing, and they're not causing some of the issues like demanding a trade or demanding people be fired or everything that Kyrie Irving brings along with it. And, and just to your point about the culture piece, it's insane. <laughs> Wacky, wild, <laughs> waving, flailed just tube men. All um, of this. And, but, and, it, and it's crazy to think that Sean Marks is both the architect of the reconstruction and, uh, and of the culture of the Nets to make them attractive for superstars and has also been at the helm as this thing has been crumbling down around them. And it just, I think again, speaks to, and we said this back way back when they got them and over these last couple of years, how uh, they said, well, you need, this is what happens. When you get superstar talent, you have to be willing and understanding you're going to acquiesce to their needs, to their wants and their desires. And in some ways, maybe the Nets organization didn't realize fully that that was going to be a part of this process. However, more critical than any of that is which superstars, right? Which are the superstars that you do have to acquiesce to, even if it's LeBron James and yes, sometimes he's going to push the button for certain players to be brought in that don't ultimately pan out. Okay. But you still know you have LeBron James with consistency. If Anthony Davis is healthy, you know what you have in those players. Kevin Durant, technically you can make that statement around, you know what you have with him when he shows up and he always does show up. But th that's the thin line to me about going in on these or Dame Lillard in Portland. I think we talked about him last time we connected Andy of, Hey, listen, whatever he is or is not as a player unto himself, He's never been a problem for the organization. It almost made it easy to give him that much extra money and keep him around. And now look, we found a way. We've rounded ourselves into a team that might be high-level competitive around him. Those are the, the, the margins that you're dancing in, and the Nets have not had that ability to do so. Well, you mentioned Dame, and in talking about LeBron, and I think this is another really big difference between the Lakers and the Nets with where they are right now. As much as he can be passive-aggressive, as much as he – can be a little bit, what have you done for me lately? You know, he's known for ratcheting up demands and trying to apply that type of pressure. And his first season with the Lakers, I thought his leadership was pretty abysmal. When he is engaged, and that has been most of his time with the Lakers, he is among the best leaders in the league, as is Damian Lillard, which made me think about this in the first place. Um, they are true leaders. Kevin Durant, as great as he is, has never been thought of as a really good locker room team leader. Certainly Kyrie Irving has never been that way. James Harden has never been that way. Ben Simmons has I never say. been that way. Yep. And when you, you know, there have been, I've recently heard some people co covering the Clippers, wondering if you have a bit of that issue with Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. Like you need, if you're going to be hunting superstars and letting superstars create your culture, at least one of them has to be an established leader with credentials and, and a track record for doing it. And the Lakers have that with LeBron. It's not always perfect, but you know that it's there. And I think that's one of the mistakes that the Nets have made in allowing Durant and Kyrie to just completely revamp their culture in you know, to their liking. It's always being done with no accountability or leadership whatsoever. And you can even make the case, too, that as much as we at least gave some level of understanding to the idea of the circumstances that Steve Nash was in, appointing a first-time head coach, coming right from being a player to being a coach and not having any experience or not necessarily having the ability to, to set forth whatever standard or expectations, right? Vogel, while no longer the Lakers coach, at least brought a track record himself to that situation, and you would think brought value to that room, whereas we know Steve Nash, uh, value for seven games, and then no longer. That being the case, I don't oh, – go ahead, uh, Brian. I was just going to ask you guys both, and I know we're, we're, we're running low on time, but, like, I wanted to ask you guys both. Like, obviously, we're heading into the weekend. Things feel better around the Lakers. You know, two wins, as Andy said before, don't solve everything. A lot of their problems are still their problems, but it, there's a feeling that – Okay, at least there's a way for this Westbrook thing to not be a disaster. He seems to be potentially an effective sixth man. Darwin's controlling those minutes. He's willing to play him, sit him as needed. And and Westbrook, even if it's double middle fingers, seems willing to play the role for a while. 
Win, um, wins matter, by the way. Nets fans want to raise a banner after beating the Pacers on that second of the back to back there with them. You so. win two in a row. It does you know Matt Ryan, you know, save the season and that win, you know, there's at least a feeling that okay, it's getting a little bit better. If they could score consistently, the defense is there and and so on and so on. The flip side is you write the rosters down on you know on a pure talent level. I, I have underestimated whether it's Kendrick Nunn, whether it's Jamal Murray, whether it's Ben Simmons, the impact of missing an entire year of basketball. But I still believe that Ben Simmons is an excellent player. Um, and in game 50, this is going to look much different or could. So you have Kyrie, you have Durant, you have Ben Simmons. You know, Joe Harris is theoretically going to get healthy and TJ Warren is theoretically going to get healthy. And all. the roster that Brooklyn's working with still on paper is very good or could be 30, 40 games from now. The Lakers roster that they're working with is still very problematic. So when you guys look forward, projecting 65 games into the season, where do you think this is? Like, Are the Nets still going to be better off than the Lakers, or does what we see now with all the other stuff that is clearly problematic, um, does that kind of sink them in a way that it might not sink the Lakers you know, who just have regular old roster problems. It's funny that you bring it up because coming into this season, we we were making the case with the addition of Royce O'Neal, right? Nicholas Claxton's taking this next step. Whenever Ben Simmons gets his legs fully underneath him, even a guy I was very high on, on signing Yuta Watanabe, and that looks like that's panning out. This is arguably, with Seth Curry and everyone being healthy, the best version of the Brooklyn Nets roster that they've had in the Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving era. Best top to bottom roster they've had. However, sixty five games from now, I, I don't even, I don't know how this right now plays out. I don't think that we're fully out of the weeds on the Kyrie Irving situation. I mean, we're obviously not out of the weeds. We're in the thick of it right now. I don't know how it gets resolved though. There's been some speculation around what is Ime Adoka, who has a strong relationship by all accounts with Kevin Durant, but is not necessarily the type of coach with the type of personality that will mesh well with Kyrie Irving. Like I, I don't know if this thing and this hiring of Ime is so much about doing whatever you can to save this season or saying his off-the-court issues aside that over a year ago, we should have parted ways with Steve Nash, elevated Ime, who has connections with Ben Simmons from his time in Philadelphia, has connections with Sean Marks from his time in San Antonio, that we missed the boat there. And we're going to give this guy a second chance and then we're going to see what happens. And if, if you're Kevin Durant and you came into this offseason first demanding a trade, then demanding people to be fired because you didn't want to go through another bad experience, name a, name a worse experience than what's happening right now. And I don't know if 20 games from now, depending on what the record looks like, that he won't be singing the same song, maybe justifiably, hey, what does the market look like for me? I don't know if I want to stay here and be a part of this. So, I, yeah, I, the Lakers, to me, are unquestionably at least going in a better direction from a consistency standpoint. There it is. Raise How do you the, like us now? How do you, know you what, like and, us and, now? And it should be. And to everything you mentioned about Westbrook and what he needs to do for himself, right, for his own career beyond the Lakers, there should be value there. And there's no reason when you look at the Western Conference to say, by the time we get to the deadline, the Lakers are going to be in a position to say, can we make a little tweak here? Can we do a little something and be a playoff team? Which ultimately, I think in the short term for them, that was the biggest goal. Still be competitive, still be a playoff team. And next offseason, when you move off of Westbrook, then you can reassess how you want to build around LeBron and AD. Look, man, at the end of the day, Lakers exceptionalism is a thing. Nets exceptionalism <laughs> doesn't exist. <laughs> It's really that simple. No, there's exceptionalism, exceptionally dysfunctional. That counts. <laughs> you can't you, can, you can't tie that word in there uh, without making it official. Listen, um, I hopefully for for Lakers fans, uh, this was still an enjoyable episode, even if just from the standpoint, as I know fans like to do, you get to look across the country and say, "What a mess!" Thankfully, mm -hmm. it's not us. We appreciate, as always, uh, for locked on Lakers, locked on Nets. Obviously, myself, Doug Nori, who's Taking a vacation for some insane reason, and the Kaminetsky I don't blame brothers. Him. Lucky, right <laughs> what a lucky time to be taking a vacation! Oh my no, god, he, he luck out. You know you're not coming back. You know he's not right, coming no, back. Actually, right. yeah, he's on sabbatical <laughs> with an option to just decline. He may not return on the extension. Uh, bottom line is, man, you follow the Locked On Lakers, you follow the Locked On Nets, obviously on the Locked On Podcast Network, on YouTube, on the podcast feeds, and I'm sure 
maybe I'll make the choice if I want to do another crossover like this somewhere down the road in the season, depending on how things go. Gentlemen, always appreciate getting. Thanks, man.